If you found this reader's guide helpful, please consider pledging your support to Voice of Geekdom on Patreon, and gain access to premium content. Last time on The Silmarillion Explained, we covered the travels of Arathel Arthaniel, the White Lady of the Noldor, who had begged her brother's leave to depart the hidden realm of Gondolin, to seek out their cousins, the Sons of Feanor. Aradel and her companions from Gondolin first tried to enter Doriath, but were denied entry by Thingol's guards. And then, en route to Himlad, where Kelegorm and Curafin usually dwelt, Turgon's escort were separated from Aradel after coming under the attack of the offspring of Ungoliant in Nan Dungotheb. Later, Aradel wanders into the secluded forest valley of Nan Elmoth, and there she is stalked by the Sindar weaponsmith Aeol, who was called the Dark Elf. Aeol uses his magics to prevent Aradel from leaving that place, and when she finally arrives at his dwelling, deep in the forest, he seduces her and takes her for his wife. Aeol and Aradel have a son together in the year 320 of the First Age. Not that the date is given in the Silmarillion, mind you. This is based upon the Grey Annals, published in the War of the Jewels, one of the foundational draft texts which the published work draws upon. Aradel's son was named Maeglin, which means Sharp Glance. This was his father name, and so a Sindarin name, of course. Even if Thingol hadn't banned the use of Quenya, Aeol, who hated the Noldor, would never have permitted the use of that tongue in his household. Despite this, Aradel kept in her heart the name Lomion for her son, a secret Quenya birth name. Aradel stayed true to her own culture in doing so, and yet kept this hidden from her oppressive and contemptuous husband. You have to think that there had to have been quite a lot of mutual denial going on in this unhappy marriage. The narrator explains that Maeglin took after both of his parents in different ways. In appearance, he mostly prominently resembled one of the Noldor. He had the bright eyes and black hair of his mother's kin, and yet he had the curiosity and love of metalcraft that were characteristic of his father, and the son often accompanied him on his journeys to the dwarven mansions in the Blue Mountains. But Maeglin was closer to his mother than to his father, and he had a deep regard and innate curiosity about his mother's people, the Noldor, and specifically the people of Gondolin. Perhaps Aeol's hatred of the Noldor, clearly a taboo subject for him, even enhanced that curiosity further. Maeglin loved to hear tales of their deeds, and especially of Turgon, his uncle. The text also emphasises here that Turgon had no heir, potentially highlighting Maeglin's possible ambition to fill that void, which is especially intriguing in light of the later part of the Gondolin storyline, which we'll come back to later on. By no means would his mother reveal to Maeglin where Turgon dwelt, nor by what means one might come thither, and he bided his time, trusting yet to wheedle the secret from her, or perhaps to read her unguarded mind. But ere that could be done, he desired to look on the Noldor, and speak with the sons of Feanor, his kin, that dwelt not far away. But when he declared his purpose to Aeol, his father was wrathful. You are of the house of Aeol, Meglin, my son, he said, and not of the Glodrim. All this land is the land of the Teleri, and I will not deal nor have my son deal with the slayers of our kin, the invaders and usurpers of our homes. In this you shall obey me or I will set you in bonds." And Maeglin did not answer, but was cold and silent, and went abroad no more with Aeol, and Aeol mistrusted him. We can see here already the paranoia which permeates this extremely dysfunctional household. 
Aeol has created this environment, and his wife and son are living in a state of perpetual domestic tyranny. This also shapes Maeglin into the elf that he becomes, his very natural questions about where he comes from, and his curiosity about his mother's people, become something warped and secretive in him, almost bordering on an obsession, where we are told that he was seeking to read his mother's unguarded mind. A violation for which we should also be intensely suspicious of him as readers. All of this is to foreshadow and to lay the foundation for who Maeglin will go on to become. Eventually, Aeol left Maeglin alone at home with his mother, and he was able to seize upon this opportunity to attempt their escape. It came to pass that at the midsummer, the dwarves, as was their custom, bade Aeol to a feast in Nogrod, and he rode away. Now Maeglin and his mother were free for a while to go where they wished, and they rode often to the eaves of the wood, seeking the sunlight and desire grew hot in Maeglin's heart to leave Nan Elmoth for ever. Therefore he said to Aradel, Lady, let us depart while there is time. What hope is there in this wood for you or for me? Here we are held in bondage, and no profit shall I find here. For I have learned all that my father has to teach, all that the Naugrim will reveal to me. Shall we not seek for Gondolin? You will be my guide, and I will be your guard." I think Aeol's relationship with the dwarves is quite a noticeable one. We have heard of other elves who have a business relationship with the Naugrim. Menegroth and Nargothrond were both devised and built with their aid. They traded regularly with Caranthir, son of Feanor, and they crafted the Nauglamir for Finrod. Finrod was perhaps on the most cordial terms with the dwarves, but this is the first time that we've ever heard of them inviting an elf into their own city to attend a feast. Given Aeol's strange and crooked nature among his own people, this stands out as a characteristic. Aradel agrees to leave with Maeglin, and she misled her husband's servants, attempting to buy her and her son more time for their escape leading them to believe that they sought the sons of Feanor in the northeast, instead of returning to Gondolin. When Aeol returned earlier than expected, he left immediately to pursue his wife and son into Himlad, and there he was taken by the people of Kurufin. Then Kurufin said to Aeol, What errand have you, Dark Elf, in my lands? An urgent matter, perhaps? that keeps one so sunshy abroad by day." And Aeol, knowing his peril, restrained the bitter words that arose in his mind. "'I have learned, Lord Corifin, he said, "'that my son and my wife, the White Lady of Gondolin, have ridden to visit you while I was from home, and it seemed to me fitting that I should join them on this errand.' Then Corifin laughed at Aeol, and he said, they might have found their welcome here less warm than they hoped, had you accompanied them. But it is no matter, for that was not their errand. It is not two days since they passed over the Orosiac, and thence rode swiftly westward. It seems that you would deceive me, unless indeed you yourself have been deceived. And Aeol answered, Then, Lord, perhaps you will give me leave to go, and discover the truth of this matter. You have my leave, but not my love, said Kurufin. The sooner you depart from my land, the better will it please me. Then Aeol mounted his horse, saying, It is good, Lord Kurufin, to find a kinsman thus kindly at need. I will remember it when I return. Then Kurufin looked darkly upon Aeol. Do not flaunt the title of your wife before me he said. For those who steal the daughters of the Noldor and wed them without gift or leave do not gain kinship with their kin. I have given you leave to go, take it, and be gone. By the laws of the Eldar I may not slay you at this time, and this counsel I add, return now to your dwelling in the darkness of Nan Elmoth, for my heart warns me that if you now pursue those who love you no more, 
Never will you return thither. Kurofin is not wrong to predict that Aeol is on a doomed mission that will lead him to his ruin and death, although there's definitely more than a dash of irony, and perhaps a splash of hypocrisy, when we think about the reality of the Oath of Feanor, which Kurofin and his brothers swore long ago, and the tragic ends which we have good reason by now to assume that Kurofin himself is headed towards. These two characters actually have more in common than either one would like to admit, and perhaps that was part of why they disliked one another so palpably. It's possible also to partially sympathise with the grievances of both of these characters. As odious as Aeol may be, he has a point about the Noldor and their return to Beleriand, the lies and the kinslaying, and maybe even the subjugation of the Sindar lands to the north. Aeol leaves Kurofin and pursues his wife and son westward, spotting Aradel in the distance, by the glint of her white cloak, just as they arrived at the outer gates ahead of him. Aradel and Maeglin were joyfully welcomed by the Gondolindrim, and King Turgon was pleased with Maeglin, his sister son, and offered him a place at his court. Maeglin in turn took Turgon as his lord and king, and was in awe of the great city of Gondolin. Maeglin also first notices the king's daughter Idril, his first cousin, and he desires her greatly. We'll get a little more on this disturbing development at the end of the chapter. Meanwhile, Aeol had also now arrived at the hidden entrance to Gondolin, and was taken captive by the gate guard. A messenger was sent to the city to report to the king. Lord, he cried, the guard have taken captive one that came by stealth to the dark gate. Aeol he names himself, and he is a tall elf, dark and grim, of the kindred of the Sindar, yet he claims the Lady Aradel as his wife, and demands to be brought before you. His wrath is great, and he is hard to restrain, and we have not slain him as your law commands. Then Aradel said, Alas, Aeol has followed us, even as I feared. But with great stealth was it done, for we saw and heard no pursuit as we entered upon the hidden way. Then she said to the messenger, He speaks but the truth. He is Aeol, and I am his wife, and he is the father of my son. Slay him not, but lead him hither to the king's judgment, if the king so wills. Some of Aradel's autonomy and confidence has returned following her escape from Aeol's clutches but she obviously still fears him and his vengeful nature. The messenger from the guard of Gondolin notes that Aeol was resisting arrest, and also that he was approaching the gate by stealth. All of this suggests that Aeol had murderous intent in his mind, and was attempting to infiltrate Gondolin originally. Perhaps the events that are about to unfold could have been much uglier if Aeol had managed to successfully elude the guard. It makes you wonder what his plan might have been, if he had been able to infiltrate the city. Let's read onward. And so it was done, and Aeol was brought to Turgon's hall, and stood before his high seat, proud and sullen. Though he was amazed no less than his son at all that he saw, his heart was filled the more with anger, and with hate of the Noldor. But Turgon treated him with honour, and rose up and would take his hand, and he said, Welcome, kinsman, for so I hold you. Here you shall dwell at your pleasure, save only that you must here abide and depart not from my kingdom, for it is my law that none who finds the way hither shall depart. But Aeol withdrew his hand. I acknowledge not your law, he said. No right have you or any of your kin in this land to seize realms or to set bounds either here nor there. This is the land of the Teleri, to which you bring war and all unquiet, dealing ever proudly and unjustly. 
I care nothing for your secrets, and I came not to spy upon you, but to claim my own, my wife and my son. Yet if in Erethel your sister you have some claim, then let her remain. Let the bird go back to the cage, where soon she will sicken again as she sickened before. But not so, Maglin. My son, you shall not withhold from me. Come, Maglin, son of Aeol. Your father commands you. Leave the house of his enemies and slayers of his kin, or be accursed. Maglin knows that Aeol has no real leverage here, and he doesn't need to respond. And he also knows his father, and he is most likely expecting his short temper to get him killed here. Leaving with his father is not an option, of course, and one cannot really blame him for not choosing to do so. You get the impression, though, that Maeglin, as enamoured with Gondolin and the Noldor as he is, is looking to shed his past, and forge a new life for himself as a prince and lord of the Noldor. Ambition drives him and defines him, and his childhood has shaped him into a cold and dispassionate young man, with a capacity for ruthlessness. Aeol sees the Noldor as oppressors, the Noldor see themselves as liberators, and the truth is kind of somewhere in the middle. Or rather, the two realities are not entirely mutually exclusive. Aeol is an extreme example of one side of that argument. He despises the Noldor to almost a xenophobic degree, far more so than his kinsman Thingol. And that's saying something. We already know all about the tensions between the Noldor and King Thingol. Aeol goes beyond this, he is a corrupt and hateful elf in general, and his resentment towards the Noldor is twisted into something ugly. Gondolin represents, with its peaceful mixed population of Noldor and Sindar subjects, a cosmopolitan multicultural paradise. In other words, everything that Aeol hates. And he even refers to the Noldor as the slayers of his kin, which isn't even strictly true when it comes to Turgon. This context puts his marriage to Aradel, herself a High Lady of the Noldor, into perspective, as the act of willful denial that it is. Then Turgon sat in his high seat, holding his Staff of Doom, and in a stern voice spoke, I will not debate with you, Dark Elf. By the swords of the Noldor alone are your sunless woods defended. Your freedom to wander there wild you owe to my kin, and but for them long since you would have laboured in thraldom in the pits of Angband. And here I am king, and whether you will it or will it not, my doom is law. This choice only is given to you, to abide here or to die here, and so also for your son. Then Aeol looked into the eyes of King Turgon, and he was not daunted, but stood long without word or movement, while a still silence fell upon the hall. And Aradel was afraid, knowing that he was perilous. Suddenly, swift as serpent, he seized a javelin that he held hid beneath his cloak, and cast it at Maeglin, crying, The second choice I take, and for my son also, you shall not hold what is mine. But Aradel sprang before the dart, and it smote her in the shoulder, and Aeol was overborne by many, and set in bonds and led away, while others tended Aradel. But Maeglin, looking upon his father, was silent. I think it is likely that Aeol was not searched properly before being brought to his audience with the king. On the one hand, it seems odd, since Aeol had to be restrained according to the gate guard, and we know that he had approached the city by stealth, suggesting to the reader, at least, that he had murderous intent from the very start. Of course, we, as readers, know Aeol's character better than the guards do at this point. 
It would also do a dishonour to Aeol for him to be searched and disarmed. Remember that he was brought before Turgon with diplomacy in mind, and the king initially extended his hand in friendship. The weapon which Aeol attacks with is twice referred to as a javelin. Javelin almost always refers to a light spear, which is used as a throwing weapon, which seems like it would be a very difficult item to conceal under a cloak. It was also referred to once here as a dart, but Tolkien often uses the word dart to refer to larger projectiles, which includes arrows as well quite often. I think this lends further credence to the idea that Aeol was deliberately not thoroughly searched and disarmed. Aeol appears the following day for the king's judgement, and Aradel and Idril plead with Turgon for mercy. But that night, Aradel died in her bed, as unbeknownst to the Noldor, the tip of the javelin had been poisoned. When Aeol was brought before Turgon, he found no mercy. And they led him forth to the Karak Dur, a precipice of black rock upon the north side of the hill of Gondolin, there to cast him down from the sheer walls of the city. And Maeglin stood by and said nothing, but at the last Aeol cried out, So you forsake your father and his kin, ill-gotten son. Here you shall fail of all your hopes, and here may you yet die the same death as I. Aeol was cast over the side of the city, and plummeted to his death. Aeol's last words are a curse against his son, and a hint towards a possible foresight about Maeglin's future. There's an interesting trend with characters in Middle-earth, often with the elves and sometimes with men, for a brief moment of foresight to be granted upon the threshold of death. Think back to Feanor's moment of foreknowledge before his death, with his prediction that Angband would never be overthrown by the might of the Noldor. This is a similar moment, right before Aeol's death, which is to say, without spoiling anything, we should expect Maeglin to reach a similar end as well. The Silmarillion loves to foreshadow future events. For the moment though, Maeglin will thrive in Gondolin, as the narrative is going to tell us. He becomes a favourite of his uncle Turgon. He was eager to learn from the smiths of the city, and had much to teach of the techniques he had learned from his father, and from his father's allies among the dwarves, who had had little contact with the people of Gondolin before now. He also renewed his keen interest in metallurgy, he found many rich ore deposits in the encircling mountains, which he proceeded to mine. This brief description of Maeglin's time in Gondolin, at the end of the chapter, reiterates that, though he hated his father, and did nothing to prevent his execution, he still had a great deal in common with Aeol, and even followed in his footsteps in many respects. The son has the same crookedness and sexual deviancy as his father, as demonstrated by his secret jealous obsession with the daughter of Turgon. Although they are alike in many ways, Maeglin's ability to ingratiate himself with the king, and rise to power within the court of Turgon, shows a political subtlety and cunning, which the father, who was more prone to anger, lacked. This makes Maeglin even more dangerous. In the Fall of Gondolin storyline from the Book of Lost Tales, we learn that Maeglin even founds his own house in Gondolin, the House of the Mole. Thus all seemed well with the fortunes of Maeglin, who had risen to be mighty among the princes of the Noldor, and greatest save one in the most renowned of their realms. Yet he did not reveal his heart, and though not all things went as he would, he endured it in silence, hiding his mind so that few could read it, unless it were Idril Celebrindal. For from his first days in Gondolin he had borne a grief, ever worsening, that robbed him of all joy. He loved the beauty of Idril, and desired her without hope. 
The Eldar wedded not with kin so near, nor ever before had any desired to do so. And however that might be, Idril loved Maeglin not at all, and knowing his thought of her, she loved him the less, for it seemed to her a thing strange and crooked in him, as indeed the Eldar ever since have deemed it, an evil fruit of the kinslaying, whereby the shadow of the curse of Mandos fell upon the last hope of the Noldor. But as the years passed, still Maeglin watched Idril and waited, and his love turned to darkness in his heart and he sought the more to have his will in other matters, shirking no toil or burden, if he might thereby have power. Thus it was in Gondolin, and amid all the bliss of that realm, while its glory lasted, a dark seed of evil was sown. It's fascinating to read the corruption of Maeglin described as an evil fruit of the kinslaying, it's true that the kinslaying was the largest factor in Eol's hatred of the Noldor, and yet there was a lot more to the story than this, and Eol's deviancy and his abuse of his wife and son are not only retribution for the actions of Feanor and his sons. This may reflect the point of view which the narrative in the Silmarillion is written from. It will be some time before we see that dark seed grow and come to fruition. Thanks again to Jennifer Gallagher from the Lord of the Rings on Prime Watch Party podcast, who returned here as Aradel of Gondolin. Since the part one video has dropped for this chapter, the podcast I recorded with them has also been released. You'll find a link to that in the video's description, as well as links to all of my guests' social accounts and content. Both Aeol the Dark Elf and his son Maeglin were voiced by Chase Mullins, a Los Angeles based actor, voice actor and fellow Tolkien fan. Chase reached out to me on Twitter and offered his talent for this series, which has been my privilege to benefit from, so I hope you all enjoyed his performance. Finally, Kurufin Son of Feanor was voiced by Dave from the Melonheads podcast. Dave, as well as his co-host and real-life brother, Johnny, will return later as the brothers Kurofin and Kelagorm, respectively, in Chapter 19 of Beren and Luthien. Thanks to my Axe-tier Patreon supporters, Erin M, the Maya Stephen Stark of Here Be Dragons, Kelly the Jaded Shipwright, and Alexander Petrov. Next time, the Edain, Fathers of Men finally enter Beleriand for the first time, having travelled westward from their birthplace in Hildorien, and we will learn more about their three houses, and hear about how they joined the Eldar in their war against Morgoth.